Uh, should we start? Yeah, let us know, uh, should we wait or should we start? We can start after 2 p.m. All right, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the education session on learn to drive and race autonomous vehicles. And in today, uh, this is my, I'm Rahul Mangharam. I'm a faculty member in the University of Pennsylvania, and I'm joined with Dr. Johannes Betz, uh, who, and we will walk you through a very exciting tutorial on what it takes to build autonomous vehicles and how you can actually build and learn to drive and eventually learn to race these autonomous vehicles. So in today's uh, tutorial, what we're going to cover is the first part will be focused on, well, we know autonomous vehicles are coming and they are, they are driving fast. And so what does it take to actually build such a system? And we'll walk through each of the pieces of that. Uh, then we will actually show you how you can learn to drive uh, an autonomous vehicle that is one tenth the scale of a full scale autonomous vehicle. And in the, in the learn to drive part, we'll show you how well the first rule of learning to drive is avoiding a crash. So we'll show you uh, uh, planning uh, techniques on how to avoid a crash. In the second part, we will follow uh, through on how to race because, hey, racing is a lot of fun. You're driving at the limits of performance. And that's when you get to see this tension between safety and performance that really makes you know, an autonomous vehicle shine on the road. And so there, Johannes will cover the second part and walk you through the control um, algorithms and the planning algorithms that can get you to build both a safe vehicle and one that can win the race. And so as part of the tutorial, we will have initially about 30 minutes of an overview of what it takes to learn to drive. And then we will deep dive into three specific algorithms. First, a pretty simple common sense algorithm on ob obstacle avoidance and how to drive without a map and basically how to get, you know, go around a road, go around a track and not crash into things and do that in a, in a pretty smooth manner. But then we want to sort of push the limits of performance and we start to learn to race. And that's when things get really exciting where you have to figure out, well, what's the best path to get on and how do you actually follow that path with, with, a very, uh, with some very tight corners and very high speeds. And then we will show you how to race when you're racing against other competitors and how do you actually figure out the best speeds to take uh, along the racetrack and how do you do overtaking uh, with different uh, uh, planning algorithms. So let's go on this journey now and first learn about you know, what it takes to build an autonomous vehicle. So we'll start with a very high level overview and then we'll come to something that is very hands-on, that is very practical for you to learn today. We're not just gonna talk about concepts, we're gonna talk about the concepts and we're gonna talk about how you can put those concepts into action. We're gonna go through code walkthroughs on how you can actually build a physical uh, autonomous vehicle and actually put all of these, these points of perception, planning, control into action. And this is a great gateway into the world of autonomous systems, uh, which is uh, just at the dawn right now. So let's look at autonomous cars today. Like, so we have obviously the Tesla, which has a lot of cameras, maybe one radar, uh, but it's largely, you know, uh, 
using visual optics based uh, uh, sensing uh, to provide for its navigation. Uh, we have uh, Waymo, Google-based Waymo vehicles that have a mix of uh, cameras, but lots of LIDARs. They have a short range, mid range, long range LIDARs, the laser range finders that basically, in addition to the cameras providing you know, the optical view, they also provide a depth view of where objects are in the world. And these are fused together from the perception side. And then we have you know, Uber-like uh, uh, vehicles, which are a mix of you know, cameras and LIDARs and ultrasound uh, uh, sensors. So there's a lot of sensing happening in these vehicles. And overall, the sensing goes in this way that there are many different modalities of sensing from you know, getting the RGB view of the world, capture, extracting a depth view from that world, and then looking at you know the optical flow of you know not just how far things are but also how fast things are moving in and around you and then doing object detection object tracking to know you know what are the hazards and what are around you and finally doing semantic segmentation at the bottom over here where basically this is classifying what is the drivable surface, what is not a drivable surface, what are these type of objects that we are looking at. And this is a very powerful set of you know, uh, perception inputs that go into the sensors and perception block. And then they provide a, a means for the vehicle to know where it is in this world. And now the vehicle has to decide where it should go next through different types of planners. So a, a mission planner is like me driving from you know, Washington DC to New York. It's like Google Maps, it's a very high level planner. But the, the important planner after that, which is very tricky is a, called a behavioral planner. And essentially a behavioral planner is saying, okay, well, if I have to go to New York, I have to get on, on this on-ramp to get onto the, to the highway. And therefore, I should take this on ramp, or I should take this turn, or I should overtake this vehicle. So it's really the behavior of the vehicle as it is moving, but in terms of discrete decisions that it is making. So once it has decided, say, it has to, to get onto this on ramp to get onto the highway, then the local planner basically generates a set of trajectories, and then the vehicle controller has to follow these trajectories. And the vehicle does that by actuating the steering and the acceleration and does this you know, anywhere from 20 to 100 times a second uh, at different rates. Uh, and the vehicle is essentially running through the sense, plan, act loop continually. And so that's the basics. So now that's, that's pretty involved, right? And, and that's where the challenge starts to happen that as, you know, Teslas were uh, getting put on the road back in 2016. You can see there's a stopped van here. The Tesla driving an autopilot hits this van, even though you and me as a driver would have seen that if we were paying attention to that, right? So, so it, uh, this is a higher speed drive over here of a you know, Tesla car driving in Beijing, uh, driving over 55 miles per hour. And there's a street sweeper on the left-hand side um, and the car crashes into it. And uh, on the spot, uh, a 23-year-old uh, uh, dies over there, right? And, and you can see the end of the car here. Uh, of course, this is not, the point is not to be a Tesla bashing thing, but they are the only kind of cars on the road. This is again in 2018, the Tesla driving autopilot is making a turn and it oversteers and then it crashes into the hits. So these are, you know, obviously these are picked and chosen to be the cases where the vehicle is not working. The vehicle does work in many situations, but as engineers, you know, we, we, are, we are grown to be more skeptical about things and we always want to know how we can improve things. So coming to like just this year, you know, lots of uh, Tesla vehicles were recalled. Uh, because of safety concerns uh, in this uh, autopilot or what is also called cruise control. Um, so again, the point here is not about Tesla specifically. It's just that building autonomous vehicles is very hard and they are pushing the envelope. They're doing what they have to do. I have nothing to do with Tesla really, um, <clears throat> but um, that's just an example that, that this is a very challenging problem and what we are up against. So. 
But if we look at like a very common issue, like say this car, this car over here is trying to merge in front of this truck and it's trying to, it, it keeps trying to merge, trying to merge and it's trying to decide, should I nudge in or should I just stay safe? And, um, and, and here there's this tension that, you know, should I be conservative and stay safe, but then I don't go anywhere or should I actually be more aggressive, but then I could crash into the other vehicle if my understanding is not the same. So when we are driving on the highway, we are constantly negotiating this, but it's not a very clear or a very explicit trade-off as to, you know, I could just be safe and not move and just reach home five minutes later and that's fine. Or I could reach home six minutes later and that's fine. So this kind of trade-off is not very clear. So we said, you know, what is the most, you know, extreme example of this trade-off of balancing safety and performance? And that's when we started looking at uh, racing. And in racing, here you can see uh, two racing cars over here, and they are driving at extremely high speeds, right? And here, and they're extremely uh, making very fast corners. Here's Alonso and Vettel, and they're trying to do uh, overtaking, you know, in a in a very very constrained environment. And even a slight mistake or a miscalculation over here would result in a fatal loss. And that's why we, so we got very excited about looking at racing in general, that, you know, this is an unstructured environment and you're driving at the limits of the vehicle, but you need to know what the limits are, what can the vehicle handle? And that's what a good race driver has. And to build an autonomous racing machine, you're driving at high speeds, high accelerations, you know, very short uh, planning horizons and very short uh, reaction times too. So this is really pushing that, you know, generic, you know, uh, civilian driving problem to the extreme. And we thought if we can solve problems within this realm where all the other vehicles are adversarial, they're not cooperative, they're not going to let us, you know, overtake them uh, because they want to win the race too. And if we are too conservative, then we won't win the race. If we are too aggressive, we'll crash and we still won't win the race, right? So how do we do this? And so autonomous racing has become a very exciting area where we run F110 uh, between Johannes and me and our team across the world of universities. Uh, there are over 60 plus universities involved in F110, which is basically one tenth scale autonomous racing cars. But it's 10 times the fun because you can race it and you don't need to spend you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to do that. But there are full scale racing cars in Robo Race, Formula Student, and now the Indie Autonomous Challenge, uh, which has you know, over uh, 16 teams, each team has their own car and they're gonna race head to head soon. Uh, so what it takes to build this kind of system is that you have you know, your uh, sensors um, that provide you know, the inputs to the perception that are trying to localize the vehicle, detect where it is, what is around this vehicle. Then they have to plan. And, and then they have to basically, once they have a plan, they basically have to follow that trajectory, uh, both on a path and figure out the velocity to follow. And now we want to put this to a more stressful kind of environment within racing. So in today's tutorial, we're going to walk you through first an overview of what it takes to do all of this perception planning control. And then we're going to deep dive into uh, example algorithms so that you can learn with the code, you know, what it, what it takes to have very simple perception based navigation, uh, the most basic but elegant planning and control algorithms to get you started. And, and all of this runs, you know, in our simulators runs on the 110 scale cars. So you don't even have to buy anything. You can just get started right away, you know, in your apartment or your room, wherever you are. So I'll start with an overview of, you know, what we started to build back in about 2016, 2017 was a 110 scale autonomous racing car that came, you know, that comes with, you know, a LiDAR, uh, cameras, depth sensors, uh, and a GPU on board. And this car is capable of driving up to uh, 40 to 50 miles per hour. So at 110 the scale, that's a very high speed. And, uh, and, and it's easy to program. There are a lot, there's a lot of software that works very well. Uh, it's it's bug-free software, as far as we know, simulators to support and a whole community to work with you. Uh, so 
what has already been done is that the mechanical aspects from the power distribution boards to integration of the sensors, a basic you know, autonomous vehicle software uh, stack for perception planning control that runs on both the CPU and the GPU on board, uh, all of that has been done. And so now you basically have you know, a very easy way to get this started. You can build this from scratch, we can lend systems to teams that want to race in the next competition, uh, but this enables a lot of research in different types of you know, uh, autonomy, whether it's safe, secure, coordinated, or efficient autonomy. Uh, and there are, as I mentioned, over 60 universities that are part of this. So and our goal is really very simple. It's really to reach out to you know, students and faculty and hobbyists to build code and race these systems so everybody can learn to drive and race autonomous vehicles. And uh, from the website, you will learn to just take a bunch of these parts and then put them together within one hour. There are very good IKEA style you know, instructions, videos uh, to walk you through that. And it's a very simple setup. Okay, so now that you have this car ready, as you can see on this desk over here, we can get started with coding for this vehicle and getting it to drive. So in order to do that, we actually also built a curriculum around this. And, and there are uh, several versions of this kind of course that walk you through the basics of the robot operating system. And then from perception planning control and also topics on learning and, uh, and then uh, you know, uh, advanced topics on control. And so I'm gonna spend the next you know, 10 minutes or so just walking you through the different stages of what it takes to get a car to drive. And then we will start deep diving in these three different algorithms for uh, perception-based uh, navigation and then map-based navigation. So you actually learn something hands-on and useful over here. So the nice part was with this course that we offer every year is that there are no exams and within six weeks, this, all the students learn to get to the race day one and they're racing the vehicle. And so we'll talk about what algorithms it takes to get to race one. And we'll talk about algorithms it takes to get to race day two, where you can now use map-based approaches for uh, planning and, uh, and doing high-speed control. And then you get to the race day three and that's up now, you know, we'll hand that back to you that, okay, you, you know how to start to race things and how are you going to now push it to the limit and how are you going to compete against other teams? So, so the, the nice part was whenever we offer this course, no exams, just races, right? So it's a really fun hands-on course. Um, so let's get to uh, AV driving basics. And before I go ahead, if there are any questions, please ask, uh, you know, while we are going through things. The whole point over here is that you get out of this tutorial a lot uh, of the basics of where you can get started, how you can start to move with these things. And, and so any kind of questions are totally welcome. We don't assume any prerequisite knowledge, you know, besides basic uh, linear algebra and, you know, uh, basic mathematics. But uh, so in the introduction, what we start with is before you learn to use this car, you need to make sure that you learn to drive it safely, right? so that it doesn't crash into objects and it doesn't crash into the wall. So you, the first kind of lab that we actually get hands-on is to build an automatic emergency braking system that with the sensors, you detect how far objects are and you can calculate the time to collision. And then you base your braking based on the uh, time to collision, right? The time it takes that it, that it would have taken to crash into that object, and so the so now you have a car that is at least safe at a very basic level. It it no matter what algorithms you put on it now, it will not crash into objects <clears throat> and it will not crash into the wall. So that's a good place to start. First, be safe, then have fun. But as engineers. You know, we also want to convey that, you know, uh, you might say you might have a lot of trust in what you sense and the decisions that you're making uh, in building this autonomous uh, vehicle, but you have to watch out for the false positives that, that will cause the vehicle to jerk a lot, thinking that there are many obstacles 
and it may not perform very well, but it's still pretty safe. Or false negatives, which are even more critical that it did, it did not see the object that was there and it goes and crashes into it. God forbid it, it was a person and a, and a full scale autonomous car goes and crashes into that person. And, and there have been many examples of that too. So the false negatives are what we really want to watch out for. Oh. But in order to aid all of this so that you can actually get started, we have built uh, two uh, simulation environments. One is a basic um, open AI gym based uh, simulation environment uh, called the F1 10th gym. And that's uh, you know a 2D simulator captures all the vehicle dynamics. It's very lightweight and easy to get started with. You get all the sensor inputs and now you can run all of the basic algorithm. And then of course, you know, we have to do things that are much more photorealistic and uh, we have a unity based environment in the LG SVL simulator. And, uh, and that bridges to, you know, because that, that allows you to design things at this one ten scale and then port that kind of work to a full scale vehicle. Uh, so now that you have built this vehicle and you have the sensors on board, the issue is that each sensor is viewing the world from its perspective. You know, there's a LIDAR from here, there's a depth camera from another perspective. And you need to sort of make sure that we can adjust these poses so that they can all come to the same. We understand their reference frames and we translate their reference. We, we, we translate the observations from those reference frames uh, to a common you know, uh, world uh, coordinates over here, right? So, uh, so you have, we, we talk about, you know, how do you do rigid body transforms and the assignment is how to do the pose transformations within ROS for all the sensors that are there. Uh, and this is very important because when you work on a real autonomous vehicle, you have a bunch of LIDARs, cameras, ultrasound, radars, and you need to combine all of their perspectives into one global perspective because they are all placed in different things. And if the, if the car changes, the positions of these uh, sensors change, and now you need to calculate that, right? So, and then as you're getting the sensor input now, each sensor is showing you the world from its perspective or it's basically its observation frame. So for example, in this case, the laser is showing you the observation from the laser's perspective, but you want to capture it you know, more holistically from a global frame of reference. So how do you translate from this local reference, laser frame reference to a global frame of reference? And that's the beginning of you know, working with these sensors because we want to now essentially have a software-based you know, autonomous vehicle, but that's why we need to make sure we get the right perspectives from these sensors. Okay, great. So we've integrated the sensors now, and now we are tuning the motors, the steering control, the throttle, uh, all of this has to be tuned. So there's very easy software to tune these controllers and, but then you have to figure out, you know, what kind of gains that you would have for these, right? So then we move to, okay, we need want to just drive this car down a corridor and make simple turns and do one loop for that, right? So uh, we don't have a map. We don't know how to build a map at this point. We just have, you know, uh, basic sensors like a laser uh, uh, distance sensor. And so we start with just following the wall. It's just kind of like what you would have done, you know, in high school or in your, in your early bachelor's is like, you know, like follow a line here, you're just following a wall and this car is, you know, conservatively just driving and you can see it's wobbling uh, quite a bit and it's following this left wall and then it follows the right wall and then it just does that, right? So, so this is just a very simple, but in order to do that, you have to tune your PID control gains appropriately. And here you can see if you don't tune it well, the car will crash here. If you don't tune it well again, the car will wobble across quite a bit. And so you get some pretty hands-on you know, steps. And this is again, just within the first three weeks of you know, working with this car. Fine, so now you have the sensors integrated, you have the car, you know, the, the throttle and the steering controls are fine-tuned. Uh, so what do we do now? We want to basically drive, but there would be, you know, obstacles along our path. And how do we get to this smooth drive as we have obstacles? And how do we get this car to basically drive through? And so we will, get, we will deep dive into this algorithm in the second part which is called follow the gap. It's essentially a, a, a reactive planning method. 
and uh, we'll show you how you can you can actually implement this algorithm with the code. So it just navigates through um, the corridors without a map, but it is very smooth and graceful and, and can do that at a reasonably good speed. And, and this is what we were using, you know, and many teams were using this kind of algorithm without any map until 2018. And you can see this racing and this is in Portugal as part of CPS week. And uh, there were over 400 people in the audience. It was a very fun race. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so then obviously we want to get to more sophisticated, you know, planning and, and control algorithms that are map based because that's how, you know, modern autonomous vehicles work. And that's, but in order to understand how these maps work, we understand the core algorithms that live under the hood for example, like a scan matching algorithm that I take a snapshot at this position and then I take a snapshot at the next position. So how do I know where this robot is with respect to the previous frame? So there are algorithms like scan matching and we walk through these kind of algorithms such as iterative closest point uh, matching. Uh, and we teach, we show you how to implement these algorithms. So you know under the hood, how these simultaneous localization and mapping algorithms, what kind of approach they're using with every scan they're getting from the camera or from the lasers or from the different sensors. And then we use a out of the box, you know, high performance uh, SLAM simultaneous localization and mapping software. And that basically is a Google's cartographer to build a map. And, and so this works very um, well on the F110 platform. And now you can start to build a map. So once you have built a map, then you need, then you start to drive the vehicle the next time. And you say, okay, uh, I know I have a map, but how do I know where on this map I am? And so then we'd walk you through how you do this with the particle filter algorithms that as you're getting multiple observations, how do you guess the best, have, make the best, best guess for what is the pose of this vehicle? And so the assignment is to run this particle filter algorithm to localize the vehicle in this map, first in simulation, and then for real within this corridor, as you see over here. Uh, and then now comes the fun part. So now we are ready to actually drive very fast, okay? Because I have a map, I know where I am, I'm able to localize myself on the map, and now I can just say, hey, let me put down a set of waypoints and now let me drive along those waypoints. And so in the second part of this tutorial, Johannes will walk you through this kind of pure pursuit uh, uh, algorithm, which is a very basic planning control algorithm that's saying, okay, let's follow this virtual line. But there is a lot of you know, mathematics under the hood that you need to understand to be able to smoothly follow this line. The nice part is that you can then drive very fast over here, right? So uh, much faster than if we were running at 30 in the morning. It's a really good workout because now the car can drive faster than, you know, the car students can drive. All right, just keep it going. So don't feel bad for him. He's, he's a very good engineer right. now in engineering on the next level of form. So that's great. So now we have, you know, vehicle that can actually drive because it has built a map and it's facing the impact. You can also use the best hot message. So this is map based methods of planning. Then we but then we start uh, then we start of, of localization, uh, mapping and localization, and then we start to say, okay, how do we plan so that this vehicle can be very agile and that this vehicle knows where it has to go. And so we walk through search-based planning methods, sampling-based planning methods, uh, RRT, and you implement this in the simulator, and then you implement this on the real car. And in the second part, Johannes will go through, you know, what are the kind of planning algorithms you would use to race your car, not just to drive it, right? So how do we do that? And how do you build these planning algorithms, you know, uh, so that they can aggressively do these overtakes? As advanced topics, we cover model predictive control and how do you do the trajectory optimization and, sam and how you use sampling based MPC to figure out what are the feasible trajectories and what are the best trajectories to do to just navigate and then to also overtake. 
And then again, as advanced topics, you know, in the latter part of the course, we look at classic computer vision, like all the way from basics of understanding the camera model, single view geometry, homography, to detecting features and then to predicting. And so this is like doing camera calibration, detecting the poses or using April tags and predicting the trajectory of the vehicle in front of you. And then you also are able to use learning based computer vision methods like using tiny YOLO on board, which works at over 72 frames per second, very fast, you know, and, and the, because the computation platform we have on board is an NVIDIA Jetson, it's a very powerful one and more than capable than what, what we are using it for right now. And so here, here you use how to run, you know, off the shelf CNNs and, and make this pipeline faster, but to train it just for this vehicle, right? And then advanced topics are more on the lines of, you know, how do you use reinforcement learning where you as a driver teach the, uh, the algorithm to basically learn to drive like you as good or as badly as you, and so this is like understanding imitation learning and implementing it. And we offered this as a project option in the past. And eventually you now put all of this together and you're ready to race. And uh, we are ready to race, but head to head with another vehicle in front of us. And you, know, you have to avoid crashing it. You have to try figure out how to do overtakes for it. Here you can see we are you know, very much in pursuit of the other vehicle trying to figure out an, a, a, a opportunity to overtake without crashing. It's almost crashed into that vehicle. And then it gets very exciting there. It bumped into that vehicle. And uh, so, so this is, uh, you know, now you're really seeing your algorithms, you know, in action. And, and this is what we have uh, at our autonomous racing competitions. Um, so, so now let's get to the, the, the main part of the tutorial that we're done with about the first half an hour. And so I will walk through, you know, what we call reactive algorithms. That means these are map free algorithms without a map. How can I have a simple algorithm to navigate the world? And then in the second part, uh, the second hour that we have, Johannes will uh, cover, you know, how do you follow a racing line? What kind of, you know, control structure do you use uh, to do that? How do you determine, you know, what is the path and the velocities to use? And then also, how do you actually now come up with you know, planning algorithms to actually race and how do you figure out how you can win the race over there. So, uh, so if, there are, if there are any questions, once again, please ask. Uh, we are here to make sure that, you know, uh, we, we, we fill in all the blanks or anything that you have. So, so please go ahead and ask questions. Uh, hi, Rahul, Avril here. Uh, hey, the programming in these uh... Uh, examples or this project is in C or Python or which language? Oh, uh, Avira, that's a great question. Uh, and uh, uh, so the programming is in, in both C++ and in Python, and you can pick either one, whichever you are more comfortable with. And uh, in at the end of each of these, you know, parts of, you know, that I just mentioned over here, at the end of each of these, um, Johannes will walk through the coding part of it and we'll actually go through the code and understand how the code is written so it becomes much more clear. But that's a great question. We want to be very practical and teach you how to get started with this. The nice part with running everything you know, in ROS is that you can either do C++, but many more students are now more comfortable with Python. You can use Python too. So, so both languages work. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Okay, please don't hesitate to ask uh, whenever you have any questions, uh, we are here for you. Uh, all right, so, so let's look at how do we avoid, you know, crashing and basically running these reactive planning algorithms. So essentially we want to learn how to drive this car in, uh, in a track, first of all, and follow this track along. And you can notice that this track is mostly a closed track, like it's a closed loop over here, but it's also very smoothly and very efficiently navigating these obstacles without any map over here, right? So it, it is, it's not just following the wall over here, it is really trying to do something slightly smarter than that. 
And, and this is an example that I've showed before. You can just see this vehicle is navigating uh, you know, all these obstacles. Yeah, keep going. And, and you know, people can jump in front of it, dynamic obstacles, there's no problem with that. It does not know whether obstacles are a priori. It is just a reactive algorithm. And so we want to figure out how do we get that level of performance without a map? So we start with basically the sensors that are on the AVs. Obviously, you know, production AVs have a lot of different sensors. That's one of the largest cost of the autonomous vehicle besides the, the vehicle itself. But that, uh, so they, there are different types of sensors and uh, for and, and, and the reason is that you know you want to have different modalities of complementary sensing and at different ranges. And on the F110, the one sensor that we will focus on today is the planar lidar. And the planar lidar is essentially like just a 2D lidar. It's a single beam uh, that is just scanning the world at a fixed height. Like that right. So and and it's a very it's a relatively low cost. I would just put relatively in 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 quotes over here. It, uh, but it allows you to scan anywhere from you know four meters or ten meters, and then this one can go up to thirty meters and and give you. So here you can see even in the simulator we can scan and get, capture the walls over here. Uh, so uh, as long as you're on a flat surface, you're fine uh, with with a with a two D lidar, right? So so when you work with a laser scanner, it's essentially just estimating the distance by looking at you know the 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 transmission and uh, reflection of that light and it is capturing that uh, you know uh, very efficiently so it's essentially shooting a ray of light getting the reflection shooting a ray of light getting a reflection shooting a ray of light and doing that you know many times a second and so this can basically give you say about you know a 270 degree coverage um, and be able to uh, capture that you know at about uh, 20 frames per second so in the robot operating system, which is basically the, the uh, software framework that we are running over here, uh, we are able to capture these distances or these ranges uh, from across different angles over here, right? So, uh, and, uh, and, and this is essentially every 20, 20, at 20 hertz, we're able to get a whole array of distances of what's around us in the 270 degree range in front of us. So this is an example, a simplified example of what the car would see in a certain snapshot. And now we want to figure out where should the car go? And, and you know, so maybe one thing, so infinity is basically saying that there's no obstacle. As far as the range of the vehicle, the, the laser scanner goes, we haven't got a bounce back. You know, we sent the signal out and nothing reflected back. So that's just saying that, hey, that's open, that's open. So maybe we should just pick one of these infinities and just go there because that's the furthest distance. And uh, but what might be wrong with choosing that? Uh, I mean, so so these scans are happening at a very fine angle, right? So so it is going through uh, you know say about half a degree angles like that. So so the vehicle has a certain you know width over here, uh, but the scans are at a much finer you know uh, scan rate uh, scan distance. So, so even though you have an infinity there at that particular point, you know, next to that, you have very close distances of about three meters. So you have to sort of figure out, okay, that's not gonna be, I'm not gonna be able to fit through that narrow gap. So maybe I should pick, you know, uh, something like, uh, I need to have at least a bunch of, you know, far, far enough scans uh, and what is far enough? So say I have some distance threshold T, let's say five meters. Uh, and I want to say I want to have at least you know three of these scans that are you know five at least five meters away, and that says okay there's there's a good gap over there, and so essentially that's we are trying to follow the gap and just go where there is a place to proceed. We're going to proceed through that part over there, and there's another gap over there, but we want to we'll just say let's take the biggest gap that we can find and just be greedy in that manner like that right so. Uh, and so we're going to fix this follow the gap algorithm. It's so simple that it's just going to follow the biggest gap and the car should go in that direction. But this is a naive algorithm in the sense that, you know, it doesn't always work. Like in this example over here, if I have these obstacles, this vehicle 
is you know can detect within this this threshold over here within the blue circle and say it says hey there is a gap in front of me that's the midpoint of the gap i'm going to follow the gap and go there but the vehicle is going to hit the corner the edge of this obstacle right here uh, because you know it doesn't take into account like the affordances that it, it has to have and uh, so just just seeking out the largest gap is not is it might be fine for a holonomic uh, robots that can actually just you know move uh, 90 degrees left or right you know and they 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 don't have to have a uh, kind of a smooth spline movement but if it's non holonomic it's fine as long as you know the the obstacles are very sparse and spread out so you have a lot of space there but we don't have that privilege uh, you know when we are racing in corridors or driving in even on the road so this doesn't optimize for safety because it's it's a greedy algorithm uh, but it it's the vehicle is still going to hit these objects and because it doesn't consider the car's dimensions over here right and and we have to it's very hard dynamically to decide what this threshold T is and what this threshold D is in order to navigate through these obstacles. So we have a, a, like a slightly more conservative variation to this very naive approach. Uh, and that's basically saying instead of first finding the furthest point, first find the closest point, right? Like, and, and find the nearest LIDAR point and say that's the nearest LIDAR point in red over there. And to put some affordances, you're going to have a safety bubble around that. And say, for example, in this case, if we have, you know, for some radius, uh, if, if, which is basically the width of the car or how much the car would be plus some navigation affordance over there. Uh, so any of the, the LIDAR scan points that are, you know, within that range of that radius over there, we're going to basically zero them all out over there. And, and so essentially, uh, we're just going to say that that's a no-go, don't go in that direction. And, but all the other points, you know, we are now going to start to consider as free space. And now we're just going to follow the max gap. So the max gap is generally in the direction over here, somewhere along this direction, right? So, and we could go whether in the, in the middle of that max gap, um, you know, we, we could find what is the best point in that and then follow through that, right? So essentially we are again going back to follow the gap, but now we have eliminated you know, essentially we took and taken like a conservative first step. And, uh, and of course, now the thing is that, you know, if you try to just implement follow the gap, the vehicle is going to constantly keep measuring and it's just going to keep shaking and oscillating over there. And it's not going to be able to do that smoothly at a good, good enough speed. So then you just add, you know, <clears throat> on top of that, essentially saying that, well, if we are, if the obstacle is about three to four meters away, then we just keep a steady speed or use a piecewise, you know, linear uh, a speed gradient to say that if obstacles are this far away, then we are at least at this speed. If they're much further away, we can increase our speed and only decrease your or change your speed when obstacles are within a certain threshold. So, so now I'll hand it over to Johannes to actually, you know, follow through with what uh, Professor Aviril's uh, question was. Okay, let's see some code and let's uh, actually follow the gap through that. So I'll hand over the presentation uh, to Johannes and then he can continue from here. And while we're doing the handover, if you have any questions, please do ask. All right. Um, I don't see that there are any questions from your side. You can close that box at the bottom. Um, this one, yeah. Um, I don't see that there are any questions from from your side. Then, first of all, good morning, everybody. Um, we provided for you um, a whole tutorial on learning how to drive and race but it's not only theoretical we also provide some code for you 
So first of all, you have the access to the code here on this GitLab, GitHub page. You can access that and you can just download the material, um, start it in your Python environment. This is like purely written Python code. And we provided for you a special tutorial now, which, which is like a short overview of what the code can do. But we also provided a deep dive, which is much longer, about like 10 to 15 minutes, where the code is explained in detail. So to give you just an overview of the first material, let's have a look together on the tutorial video. But I just need to share my video again. It's not. All right, um, let's have a look at the first video together. All right, now it's time for us to deep dive into the code because this lecture is not only the theory, we want to show you some hands on code. We provided a GitHub repository for you. You see the link here in the lecture slides. Just download it and you see the following structure here on the left side. First of all, what we do, we look into the follow the gap code. So open the Python file called follow the gap and you see here 80 lines of code. When we start exactly this file, what you then see is that a new window is coming up and this window includes the simulation environment. You see here the complete race track, one to 10 scale, where you see a small car driving along the racetrack. And that, my friends, this is our follow the gap. And this follow the gap is trying to avoid the obstacles along the way. You see now this car is trying to finish two laps and because our simulation environment is created like that. We can watch the car completely, but we just wanted to give you a high level introduction about the code. This simulation is calling one specific functionality called process LiDAR. And we find this process LiDAR in the driver's file. Just open this one and you see here a class called gap follower. In this class gap follower, we find uh, the function called process LiDAR here. And we see that everything we just learned about in theory is made in code in Python code here. First of all, we need to pre-process, then we need to find the closest point to the LiDAR. When we found the closest point, we create the bubble around this point and set every other points to zero. Then we try to find the sequence of points. We find the max length, which defines our final gap. And then when we have done that, we write one function that focuses on one point. Finally, and that's the last step, when we know what this X, Y position is, we try to create a final steering angle. And that steering angle is sent to the simulation environment. And that's everything we need to know about the code and how to create the follow the gap in code. Finally, what you can do then with this code is adjust the parameters. For example, you saw that the car is really sm uh, slow now. Let's enhance this a little bit and make the speed faster. When I try to start the simulation now, we will see our car accelerating much faster, but you see the car is crashing because this speed is too fast. So let's, let's make it not too fast, but a little bit faster than in the beginning and start this simulation again. And you will now see that this car is driving faster, but is avoiding the obstacles and is finishing the race much quicker than before. And that is the explanation about the follow the gap algorithm created into code. Have a look into the code, start it and tune it on your own and have fun with the code. Yeah, that's basically the first introduction tutorial right. um, of now what we um, provided for you um, in our lecture today. 
But now it's time for us to learn a little bit more about how to actually race. So Raul gave the introduction about what, what do we need to drive autonomously. Now we want to do that a little bit more faster and a little bit more focused on the field of racing. So in the next chapter, I will talk about how to follow a race line and how to implement the pure pursuit algorithm. But first of all, um, what is the problem here? Because we said now we want to we want to race. And the question or the problem is, what is the fastest way to get around the track? The fastest way is called the race line because the race line is providing the waypoints, is providing for us the global trajectory that we need to follow to be as fast as possible. What we need to understand here is the optimization because all of these methods that create us the race line in the end are mainly based on optimizations. And secondly, we have to understand what is precise path tracking. Because just we know that we have the optimal path to follow, we don't know how to actually follow it with the autonomous car. So what we want to do now, implement the so-called pure pursuit controller for path tracking. So the first question is, what is a race line? What, what do we need for a race line? Because you just saw now in the picture um, some splines or some, some ways um, or waypoints. And is that enough? Is that enough for us to just have these X and Y points on our 2D map that we can follow? And the answer is no. We, when we want to have like a race line, when we're talking about race line, it means for us that we have a trajectory, a global optimal trajectory. And this trajectory, first of all, consists of the X and Y points, which means the actual path we need to follow. But at the same time, we need a speed profile. Because just we know that we have some points we can follow. We don't know how fast we can drive exactly on these points. That's what you see here in this image. You have the path, but you have different velocities along the path. Here, a lot of the things uh, that it comes to um, or that gives you troubles is the dynamics of the vehicle because the car can just drive a certain acceleration, longitudinal and lateral. lateral. So what we want to do here is create a holistic, an optimal, a global race line. And now the question arises, how do we get from a racetrack representation to our final race line in the end. So remember one problem is how do we get racetrack information? So here you have to be creative. Um, you can just go out there and create the map. It's what Raul told you earlier, like the mapping algorithms, you can get the information perhaps from the racetrack providers. What you see, can see here is an actual Formula E track in, in Berlin. So you need to get the information from the racetrack organizer. Or you can just use Google Maps, that's what we did. And we have um, a bunch of racetracks provided for you um, to the environment where we define the inner bounds of the track, a center line of the track, and an outer bounds. And therefore, we have a geometric representation of the track. And that's what we need, because this is the information we can afterwards use in our simulation and optimization environment to get this path you can see here. So when it comes to the race line creation or when it comes to finding an optimal path, when we talk about optimality, it's all about optimization methods. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with optimization techniques. Um, it's not a problem if you not deep dive into this topic yet. I just give you the high level introduction of what we need to do. When we talk about global optimal race lines, we mainly talk about three things. Number one is the so-called shortest path. You can see here in the right image, which gives you an overview of racetrack and the blue line is showing you actually the shortest path. This means we are trying to optimize, to minimize the meters, the kilometers traveled and therefore creating the shortest path. 
Well, you can see here in the right image that this blue path is going along the inner bounds and is driving then, for example, from turn two to turn three, it's making a straight way over this straight. So of course, it's trying to minimize the path traveled. So that's a, 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 a usable solution here, but it's not the best one because you can see here, this is definitely not the fastest way. So number two, number two, what we are talking about is the so-called minimum curvature line. For us as a race engineer, that means we are minimizing the curvature the car is traveling. Minimizing the curvature has a lot of um, advantages for us. First of all, we can drive very fast because if we don't drive lateral, we can drive an accelerate longitudinal. That's always good for us. Second of all, we try to minimize peaks, which means we try to minimize the steering of the car along the way. The less we're steering, the faster we are. And you can see here, this green line looks very familiar. This looks like a Formula One race line. This looks something like the race driver would do. So minimum curvature is very, very good. And both the shortest path and the geometric uh, um, and the curvature are just geometric representations or geometric optimization techniques. Finally, number three is the so-called minimum time trajectory planning. What we are optimizing here is the time traveled. And that's our the best solution we can get because this is taking into account all the constraints of the track and all the constraints of the vehicle. And it's creating us a race line. If we travel that, we are the fastest as possible. Now you can imagine the higher we get here, the more information we need. The more information we need about the car, the big dynamics parameter, the more we need to write in software and the longer this optimization takes. So we have now to make um, a trade-off between um, information we need for setting up this problem and for getting a very good solution in the end. And what you can see here, the solutions differ in the vehicle dynamics death modeling. And that's like the most important part. For example, for the minimum time trajectory planning, the, the orange one here, you need a lot of knowledge about the tires and the vehicles to get this really done. When we're talking about optimization problem, it's always the same setup. First of all, we create an objective function we want to minimize or maximize. In our case, the shortest path, in our case, the minimum curvature, or in our case, the minimum time. So length, time, and curvature, that's something we want to minimize. Then we create constraints around this optimization problem. That's like areas we're not searching for a solution or that's areas where we say this solution is constrained here, don't look in this area. And then we have a lot of optimization variables that define our problem. And that's what you normally do. Create your optimization problem based on these um, optimization objective functions, time, curvature, or path. And then you get the output of both the path representation and the speed representation. And now we have created our race line we can follow. But just that we have this race line doesn't mean that we can actually drive on this race line because one of the most important parts in an autonomous car is the controller. So the good part here is that we know a lot about controlling things. Like the engineering area is full of controlling. Like we control energy buildings, we control cars, we control airplanes, we control everything um, on the world. And that gives a us a lot of knowledge in this field and a lot of potential of actually controlling the car. But now is the question, what are we controlling? In our case, we want to control the steering of the car and the acceleration or the speed of the car. That's the two things we want to take care of. And in our case here, in this lecture, we are focusing on one algorithm called Pure Pursuit. Let's deep dive into the Pure Pursuit algorithm. We make, first of all, a few assumptions to understand the Pure Pursuit controller. First of all, we are only looking in the 2D environment. We have 
just a 2D environment, don't care about the Z axis, we don't care about 3D here. And in this environment, we have a list of 2D points, we calling the waypoints. And now you know why we created the race line before, because the race line is actually creating us these waypoints. So just think about like 500 to 1000 points that define our race line, and that's our waypoints we want to follow. Number two, our vehicle knows exactly where it is in this environment. That means we need to localize the car itself. In our case, we are don't taking care about localization techniques now. We're thinking about that we have the ground truth. We actually know where we are, which means we always know the X and Y position of our car with 100%. And finally, and that's what you can see here in this image below, we see these waypoints and now our red dot, that's the car that needs to follow these waypoints. And we have one parameter here, we call the look ahead distance. And that's the main parameter in this algorithm we wanna vary. And that's the parameter that gives us the possibility to drive as fast as possible. To understand the pure pursuit algorithm, we have provided for you, first of all, a geometric representation. We start with the following. The vehicle is in a local 2D frame. That's what you can see here. The center is on the rear axle of the car, and we have the X coordinates and the Y coordinates. We introduce now the concept of the so-called look ahead distance. You see now here, we have this parameter L with a certain distance into the future, one meter, two meter, half a meter, it's up to us. We are searching for a waypoint now that is in the close to this predefined parameter. We are calling the look ahead distance. We have now one goal point that is defined by X and Y positions. And this goal point is in the near of the look ahead distance. But here's like one thing. Our autonomous vehicle, our car, that is a robot that is non-holonomic. You can look up this definition if you don't know it, but more or less it means that the car cannot move to any point in the 2D environment directly because it has to follow a certain path. This path is defined by the maximum steering angle and the length of the car and the width of the car that's creating us a turning radius. For us, that is called Ackermann steering. And you know that the steering of the car is making this if you, if you um, turn on the steering wheel. And now is the question, when you look at this and you see that the car needs to follow a certain arc, because the car cannot just move directly here to the left or here to the right, it has to follow this arc. Now is a question for you, or you can just think about that. Do you see any problem here? Like when we when we want to follow the car, when we want to follow the dark, do we do you see a problem here? And if somebody has an idea, he's welcome to answer that question. Okay, I give you the solution here. This arc, the yellow arc you see here, and this is not unique. We have many possibilities to actually create a path that we can follow to reach this goal point. You come up probably with some more different um, ideas of why this approach is not so good. Like we have um, different constraints here that um, define the vehicle behavior. But what we are caring of is right now that this art is not unique. So now we can start off coming up with solutions, for example, like finding the shortest arc, finding the arc with the lowest curvature, but that's everything too complicated and creates too much overhead. In our solution, we are constraining the search of the arc by focusing the center of the arc on our Y axis. And that's the, the black dot you see here. So more or less the turning point of the car is on the Y axis of the car. And with this geometric interpretation, with this 
setup. You see here, we have just some basic geometry. We have now the possibility to create with very, very simple math our solution. Because what is the thing we want to achieve in the end? You see now here, this is the red arc. We want to actually follow this red arc. And that means for us, basically, what is the steering angle? We can have like a constant steering angle to reach this point. But here, it's just about figuring out what is the steering angle. Now it's time for us to solve this geometric problem. So first of all, the first two um, um, equations we create here, the radius of the arc we have, or we want to follow, that equals the distance y plus the distance d. Sounds similar, similar sounds familiar, very easy. Then we create the Pythagoras, d squared plus x squared equals r squared. And then we want to substitute the parameter d, that's nothing we, we want to use here, um, by putting that, um, putting the d information into the, the other equation. We substitute the parameter d, and now we integrate the parameter we created before the look ahead distance. L squared equals y squared plus x squared. And finally, afterwards, we we substitute or we um, shift the, the, the equation, or we become a relationship between the two most param important parameters here. Number one, the look ahead distance, and number two, the y coordinate of our goal point, and therefore the radius of the arc. And now, how do we get the steering angle? Or like, how, how does this help us in the end? Since we know the radius, we can define now the curvature of the arc. The curvature is just the inverse of the radius. Very easy. So one divided by the radius defines us the curvature. And gamma here in this um, definition is the curvature of the arc. And the final solution is our steering angle must now just be proportional to this curvature so it can follow it. So very easy, right? Because that looks familiar when you're when you're familiar with the, the field of controlling, because that's just a peak controller, which means we are proportional to this curve. And that brings us now to our final calculation for um, the steering angle, because we have now defined the curvature. And by using a geometric representation of the car's dynamic behavior, we know that the steering angle is the look ahead distance divided by, sorry, the, the radius is the look ahead distance divided by the tangles of the steering angle. We can switch the equation again and get one final equation, and that's the steering angle. Steering angle is now defined two times multiplied the y position of the goal point divided by the look ahead distance squared. And that's all we need. So it's very basic. It's very narrowed down to just two parameters, the y position of the goal point and look at distance. And that's giving us the steering angle. Of course, again, here, you have to be careful. That's a very, very simple math. That's very, very simple approach. That's nothing that's taking into account the vehicle dynamics of the car, understeering, oversteering. And that's very, very basic. But it achieves that we can follow this race line in the end. So now we have the math. Now we know what we need to calculate. There's one thing missing. How do we pick a good goal point? Or how do we even pick a goal point? Because uh, the y coordinate, that's the parameter we are needing, we are need in our calculation for a steering angle. So let's have a look on how we can pick the goal point. Just imagine these are all the waypoints on our, our line. That's the waypoints we have. And one of these waypoints might be from interest for us. That's one of the waypoints we need to follow because our car is right located in the down here. And now it's time for us to figure that out. First of all, what we do is we creating a radius based on the look ahead distance. Again, we can choose this parameter. That's up to us that we define that. 
And in this look ahead distance, we have maybe one of the, the, um, the waypoints we want to follow. So what we can do is now pick the waypoint that it's closest to the vehicle or closest to the um, look ahead distance. And that's what we can do in looking around the look ahead distance and see what is the next waypoint we can follow. Unfortunately, what, what if, if there is no um, waypoint exactly in our look ahead distance? So we really have to come up with a solution like searching for the next morn or searching for the last morn, searching in between the look ahead distance, searching for, for um, out of the look ahead distance. And that's more or less up to us, like what we decide is the best solution here. In our um, solution, what we provide is like we pick the next best one, which is like the closest one to the, the L look ahead distance. Um, and that's a possibility you can use for choosing the right goal. Um, of course, we have also the, the possibility to interpolate between two points and create then um, a new waypoint in this field, but that's a little bit too much here. Um, I would heavily recommend just searching for the next waypoint, but you can come up for with your, with your own solution what we do in this algorithm, first of all, we get the new pose of the car. Then we find the current waypoint. When we have defined this waypoint, we calculate the steering angle, which means now we create a steering angle, the car is steering towards this point. Then we localize or get the ground truth of the position. And then we repeat this again and again and again and again and again. And this looks like the following. We have now our car in our waypoints. We define based on the look ahead distance one of the waypoints we want to follow. Then we steering towards this waypoint. And now it's time for update. Now we create this algorithm again. We search for the next waypoint in our look ahead distance. We steering right toward it. We do that again, we do that again, we do that again, we do that again. And then we get the car to follow these waypoints. And that's all. So very, very easy. Having the math, having the information about the waypoints, creating a steering angle, updating, and doing it again. So last but not least, um, we need to talk about one important thing, and that's the tuning, the tuning of these, this algorithm because you see a difference when you adjust the parameter L, the look at distance. If you have like a small look ahead, that means you can update very, very closely to the car. And it means you are accurate in the end. But if you're driving too fast, this might lead to very aggressive maneuvering to track this tight arc. So you see the car is steering very, very um, uh, strictly towards this point and very, very fast. And then you see the car might oscillating and that leads to instability in the vehicle. On the other hand, you can say, let's search for a large look at distance. That gives us the possibility to have time to travel to this um, point, but unfortunately we might miss important information. For example, if we're driving into a sharp turn, we might look too far ahead. We look beyond the turn and steering towards a point that is beyond the turn, and therefore we're crashing into the wall. So that's also not a good solution. So here you have to fine tune your algorithm, especially based on the track you have. Now we are at the end um, of this second part where you learned about to create the race line and track the race line. Of course, there are many, many, many other algorithms out there that can achieve the same. The pure pursuit is the simplest one where you can start with. Perhaps you've heard from the Stanley controller. You can see here the blue car in the image. In the Stanley controller, we try to minimize two errors. First of all, the distance to our race line. And second of all, the heading of the car. That's two errors we want to minimize or we want to reduce. And therefore, that's our control values. Then there is the so-called linear quadratic regulator, the LQR, or the model predictive control, the MPC. 
Both of them are optimization techniques and both of them take the vehicle dynamics into account, which is very good for us because we are optimizing for the vehicle dynamic behavior. So we are stable or even the model predictive control is looking into the future for a certain horizon and therefore creating us optimal control values. That's very powerful algorithms, but they are not quite easy to understand and they are computationally expensive. So start with the pure pursuit, enhance to the Stanley controller, see the difference between them, and then move on to the LQR controller. And now, if you have any questions, it's time for you to, to ask. Um, I'm happy to answer all the questions. If there are no questions, then we are moving on with our second tutorial. And um, I show you in a video how to create the pure pursuit algorithm in code. All right, now we learned about the theory of pure pursuit, pure pursuit, but now we want to see it in action. Let's open our second folder called pure pursuit and open the pure pursuit file. You see now a bunch of lines of codes, um, 267 lines in total. Don't be afraid of that, it's quite easy. First of all, let's start this code together and see what we get from that. We see again that our simulation environment is opening and now we see that we have some dots here that um, display our race line we want to follow. This race, race line again is pre-computed via an uh, optimization technique and we see now our car is exactly following that race line. That's what we want to achieve because we want to be as fast as possible and that's a fast way around the track. And you can see here the race line is defined over the whole track. Let's have a look in this code in detail. We created a class for you called Pure Pursuit Planner. In this Pure Pursuit Planner you have one functionality called plan. And that's the main function. First of all we need to get the position of the car, the X and Y position on our racetrack. Based on this position, we try to find the next waypoint we want to focus on and we want to steer to. That is our get current waypoint function. And here with the parameter of the look ahead distance, we can vary this parameter. Finally, we calculate the steering angle with the get actuation function. And that is where the magic happens. First of all, we extract the waypoint information and then we calculate the radius of the arc. And based on the radius of the arc, we calculate the final steering angle with the curvature. And that, my friends, that is the whole magic of Pure Pursuit, which means just a bunch of line of codes that create the then that we follow the race line. But you saw again that this is quite slow. We have here our two main parameters. First of all, the look ahead distance and second of all the speed. Let's increase the speed gain much more. Let's ramp it up and see what the car is doing here. We start the simulation again and we'll see now that our car is going much faster. You see the acceleration is much faster, but what you also see, the car is deviating from the race line quite a lot and is drifting and we see that in particular here in that turn that we are deviating from the race line and then crashing again in our case that probably means we have to tune with the look ahead distance a little bit more i just enter here one parameter to see or show you the behavior and then that you know that this tuning is quite difficult if I increase the look ahead distance, we might be better going around the turn, but in this case, the look ahead distance was chosen too much. So we have to go down a little bit and again with the speed go also down a little bit. But that is completely up to you how you tune it. That was a short summary about the Pure Pursuit algorithm. Have fun downloading and starting it. And now we move on to the next. All right, um, if there are no questions for tracking the race line or creating the race line, it's time for you to ask. You can ask in the chat too, if you don't wanna um, ask directly here. Um, of course, Raul and I are 
um, after the talk available for, for more questions. But if there is no question from your side, then I would start with the final part for today, because now we heard a lot about how to drive the car with follow the gap, like very, very simple driving. We heard about how to follow a race line, how to track the race line, but we are not quite there um, of being a good racer and being a fast racer. Now we are just like um, a childish racer that knows how to go onto the racetrack and drives a little bit, but we are not Lewis Hamilton yet. But how can we become Lewis Hamilton? How can we really race and overtake? This is a good question. And this problem is not quite easy to answer or easy to understand because we have to take care about a lot. Like, how can we race fast? How can we plan a reliable path? How we can overtake obstacles? How we can make decisions? Because do we want to overtake on the left? Do we want to overtake on the right? Um, perhaps even more, like energy, energy consumption. Do we care about energy consumption right now? And of course, how do we predict the behavior of the opponent? So there's a lot of things we need to take care about. But we can strip that down a little bit. We are, we are in this case saying we have to understand a method that is capable of planning a local trajectory plan, a local trajectory for our race car. In this case, we choose the um, technique of the graph-based planner. And what we show you at the end is how to start this planner and how to tune this planner. So when we talk about advanced local planners, first of all, I want to give you a short overview. So there are optimization techniques. We just heard about what an optimization is. We create an objective function. We create constraints. And there are many papers out there and algorithms which give you an optimization technique that's planning you a local path. These algorithms are very powerful because in the end, you get the trajectory, the path, you get this very, very smooth, no discretization issues. But it's very difficult to create this problem. And it's even more difficult to solve that problem in a very short time which means it's computationally expansive. So again, we heard from the MPC before, the MPC would be located here in that, in that area. Even if the MPC is just a path tracker or a controller, we create a path with it that we can follow. Then number two are the so-called N-layer graph search. A very famous paper here is from Werling, which is called Optimal Trajectory in Fresnay Space we can do a robust and a fast trajectory planning. Just have a look at the car here and you see a lot of trajectories are uh, expanding from the car. You can see here also the red dot, that's an obstacle and we, we avoid these obstacles and we just now focusing on the blue path. We can't do complex maneuvers with it and that's a little bit downside. And then number three is the field of the N layer graph search. In comparison to the one layer, you see we are not expanding the graph from the car, we're expanding the graph on the racetrack, which means we need to discretize the racetrack, we need to create edges and nodes on the racetrack, but therefore have the possibility to, to search for a path in the end that is doing complex maneuvers. In the end, we have one big advantage here because we can pre-compute a lot. In the field of racing, if you ever watched Formula One, you've probably seen that the teams go to the racetrack on Friday, they have training, they have testing, they have qualifying. So we can do a lot of offline because we are in this racing field and we take advantage of that. So let's pre-compute a lot of the parts and use that afterwards. So in this particular case here in this lecture today, we are focusing on the latter part and show you one algorithm called the graph-based planner. Um, this information, everything we've shown here, is based on a paper um, that is open source, has open sourced the code, so you can have access to this code. But now it's time for you to basically understand the individual steps, what's happening in this algorithm, like each step, to understand what it needs to be to create a fine trajectory we can follow. So first of all, we start with the offline part. 
we need the information about the racetrack because we need to create a graph. So again, here, let's get the information from the racetrack. 2D information, the inner bounds, the outer bounds, and the reference line. This can be the center line of the track, but in our case, you see it here, that's our race line. That's where we are referencing to, that's what we want to follow. With this information, we start to generate our graph. A graph, you probably heard of that, consists of edges and nodes. That's like the basic definition of a graph. In this case, we're creating a state lattice with laterals, what you can see here, and with the dots, the nodes on these laterals, on these normals. You have the possibility to discretize these parameters on your own. You can narrow them down like the points. You can widen it up. You can narrow down the tangents, the normals. You can widen them up too. And that means you discretize your track more and you have the possibility to expand the search in this, in this tree or in this graph. But in the end, you have to search more and that's more computationally expansive. Our state lattice is defined here in the so-called Fernet space along our reference line, along our race line. The Fernet space is a continuous differentiable curve in three-dimensional Euclidean space. And the Fernet frame is defined as the coordinate system spanned by the tangential vector t and the normal vector n at any point on the reference line. That means if you look at the reference line, all of these points along the racetrack are defined by number one, the position on the race line, the S value, and the distance to the race line to the left or to the right. And that's how we can define any point in this coordinate frame. Afterwards, when we have created the state lattice, we are trying to combine all these nodes because we want to have a graph. In our case, we are using so-called splines. Now let's focus exactly on one of these points here. You see, when one of these points, one of these nodes, trying to reach the next goal, we have just a bunch of possibilities to reach this goal. These are the orange lines here. That's the splines that connect one node with the next node. In our case, we're using cubic polynomials. And these cubic polynomials are designed to describe the C1 continuous transition between each pair of the poses. The curves of the X and Y coordinate are described then by this cubic polynomial I've written down here for you. We have to, to or to create this cubic polynomial, we have a bunch of coefficients, A3, A2, A1. And these are chosen to fulfill the constraints you've seen here, PS, PS dot, PE and P dot. But what is a spline in our case here? In our case, a spline is just a piecewise polynomial. A piecewise polynomial is a curve broken into consecutive segments, each of which is a low degree polynomial interpolating the control points. You see here the blue line and you have to see the broken sequences here. And the most important part with when working with these splines is how do you fit them together? Because what you saw here before, when we're having this one state lattice and we want to move to the next state lattice, we create new splines. And now it's the question, do they fit together? And we are doing that with the so-called continuity C0, Z1, and Z2. The C0 continuity is just taking care about the position. Like, do we have a continuous position? Do they match from the position? The C1 continuity is taking care about the first derivative. This means the tangent line has to fit together. And you see now that the spline is changing its curvature here and it's fitting a little bit better. C1 and C0 continuity are then combined here. And last but not least, the C2 continuity. And that's the most important one because this is taking care about the curvature. And you see that the curvature from spline one and spline two fit together now perfectly. And when we transition from spline one to spline two, we don't need to change the curvature. And that's what we want to have here in the end. But when we run the offline calculation, our part, we are just taking care about Z1 and Z0 continuity. 
that reduces the computation. Finally, we are looking at the splines again. And on this page, you see where the magic of this algorithm happens finally. Because when we have these orange splines now calculated, and when we know how to connect one node with the next node, for us, it's now time to give each of these splines a cost value. That means if we travel from node one to node two, it costs us something. In our case, 5,000, <laughs> 5,000 cost values. Um, that means for us, it's more expensive to travel um, spline C1 than, for example, on spline C2. How do we come up with the cost values? In our case, we are defining a cost function that is dependent on the average curvature we are traveling on the spline, the range of the curvature, which means the change of the curvature, and the lateral offset of a spline segment to the race line. That means the far away we are from the race line, the more costs we have. And that gives us the opportunity to stick in the past third always to the race line, even when we are avoiding obstacles. But this is up to you. You can change these parameters. You can change these values to whatever you want. You can come up with new ideas of cost parameters. It's totally up to you. But this is where finally the magic happens, because when you start to search, you're searching exactly on this cost values. Now we have defined the complete offline part. Now we have this graph, the blue, the blue graph you see here on the side. That's everything we created now. The cool thing is we can save this information and put it on our computer and then load it in the online part because now we're going live onto the car. You see here now our car is positioned on the track. We get the information about where we are, we localize ourselves and start the trajectory planner. First of all, we get the updates. Um, we fetch the updates about everything. Are there any obstacles, obstacles on the track? Of course, here it's about dynamic obstacles. We can get this information from the localization tech, uh, from the perception technique or from a B2X. Where this information comes from, we don't bother here, but in the end, we need the X and Y position of the objects. And the first thing we then do is creating a local node template. You see now here in this image, we just have a bunch of blue splines and then gray splines. We only care about the blue splines. Why are we doing that? We want to focus on especially one horizon, in our case, 100 to 200 meter. Everything else, everything that's behind us, everything that's beyond these 200 meters, we don't care because we're just searching in this space. Number two is we are creating so-called action templates because our race car can just have a few actions. We want to drive straight or like drive on race line. We want to overtake on the left. We want to overtake on the right. We have here the possibility to constrain our search and to just hand over a bunch of splines for our final search. And with all these techniques, we have the possibility to reduce the search for our car. Because here's one important thing, the removal or the filtering of the edges instead of an infinity weight brings the advantage of a fast blocking detection, fast search and the avoidance of duplicate collision checks when we are processing multiple objects in the same region. Because removing one node automatically removes all the connected edges. And that's very good for us because then we need, don't need to search there. And then we are faster in the search. Now we have created these environments. We have to take care of one, mode, one very important part. That's the behavior of the other object. So we don't know what the other object is doing. Is he driving on the race line? Is he driving on the right side, left side? Is maybe he's trying to block us. Here we need an algorithm. We don't explain that today, but this algorithm is giving you a prediction of the opponent's behavior. With this prediction, you can then remove all the nodes where you think this car will not go. And this gives you the possibility to then plan your path. There are many opportunities and approaches to do that, like data-based approaches, 
neural network approaches, online learning approaches. You probably heard of prediction, um, vehicle prediction. That's a big field, an important field. But here it's just one algorithm that's giving you the final information. But again, the better this prediction in the end, the better the opponent prediction, the better your path planning, your own path planning is. So that's very important to understand here. But now let's move forward. We have created our local node template and we only search on this blue graph. We are searching with the Dijkstra algorithm, which means we are minimizing the costs we are traveling on. And then again, here, that's what I explained earlier, the costs come up again, because we are now adding up all the costs we can drive and we minimize them, which means the less the cost, the better for us in the end. That means sticking to the race line, avoiding the obstacles, being having a good curvature um, profile for the car, because in the end, you get this black spline here. And that's in this case, in this situation, in that time step, the path you want to follow. But this path here is not the one you actually drive because that's what you heard earlier. That's missing one important information. It's not curvature continuous. The offline computed splines do not serve the CE2 continuity. The first and second derivatives need to be continuous to have this curvature transition from one spline to the other, which means we use this black spline, we recalculate the splines again with this calculation, have these constraints and have now a C2 continuity spline, and that's the final one, the orange one we want to follow. That's in this time step, the X, Y positions we want to follow. And that's in this time step, the based on all the things you just heard, the optimal path to follow in this local frame for this horizon. So a lot of constraints here, but based on these calculations, that's the optimal path. But we learned in this lecture today, a race line path is not so good without its velocity. That means you use this information, the X and Y position now, and calculate the velocity. There are many opportunities like optimization techniques. You can come up with your own optimization and there's a so-called speed optimization. There's sequential programming. There's the forward-backward solver you can use. There are many opportunities to choose from or algorithms to choose from. In the end, you need to calculate the speed profile based on the vehicle dynamics, based on friction, or for example, even on the energy, if you um, are having energy constraints here. And that's our final output of this algorithm, a local trajectory that has a specific horizon. This trajectory then includes waypoints up to like 50 waypoints that have the curve linear distance in our Frenet frame, the coordinates X and Y, the heading of the car, the curvature of the car, the velocity and the acceleration. So everything we need, because this information we now hand over to our controller and say, have fun, fun with it, please control the car, and let's drive this trajectory. You learn now about the controller. We are tracking path and velocity here. You heard about the pure pursuit. Again, you can use your standard controller. You can use LQR, the MPC, because now it's time for us to track this trajectory. We created this trajectory in this path planner, and now it's time for us to track the trajectory. We are here at the end of the theoretical introduction to the graph planner. And I would now show you um, a short update, a short overview of the, the code. And then you can see how this code works um, on or in our simulation environment. All right, now it's time for our last code introduction for the so-called graph planner. Let's have a look in our folder number three called graph based planner and open the file graph planner multi vehicle. You see now that this file is a little bit bigger. We have almost 600 lines, 544 lines of code. And it, this is quite, takes quite some time to understand it, but don't worry about it. 
First of all, let's start the file first and let's see what is happening here again. We see that our simulation is coming up and a second window. In this window, we see what our code is doing at the same time. We see now two vehicles on a track. This here is our Eagle vehicle and we see it's trying to overtake the other vehicle. On the left side in the white window here, you can see what this vehicle is doing and where it's planning its path. You see that it's constantly trying to overtake the other vehicle. It has a high planning horizon in this case, um, up to 30 meters and trying to find a path around it. In addition, you see that this car is then trying to decide if it's overtaking on the left and on the right side and then trying to follow this path with the Pure Pursuit algorithm. Finally, you see, for example, here it's trying to overtake but has to slow down afterwards to maintain its security. Then you see here, for example, now the space is big and you see here on the right side that this car is planning its path around it, is going for the overtake maneuver and is trying to figure out how to overtake the other car while still focusing on the race line. Let's stop this explanation here and have a look in the code. We see that for running this code, first of all, we need to initialize the planner. In the online loop, we constantly, first of all, deciding if we want to overtake on the right, on the left, going straight or follow, get the information about where the obstacle is, the other, our opponent, then calculating the path. This is what I just recently showed you in theory and then calculating the velocity profile here in addition. Finally, we plot our outcomes is what you just see and send the trajectory out to our controller. This controller is now our Pure Pursuit or our Stanley controller and this one is tracking the trajectory. This algorithm is very powerful and takes a lot of information. You have the possibilities to tune all the parameters about your lattice, for example, discretize it differently, discretize, for example, in the curvature a little bit more, or have some curvature thresholds where you say you don't want to have a lattice. In addition, you can plan or adjust the online parameter, like the kind of controller that is used when you follow another car or how many offsets you want to have based on the velocities or how to adjust your PID controllers for the following parameters. You see, this algorithm takes quite some input, but is very, very powerful because you can overtake in the end and still maintain the race line. And that's what we are using to race with our vehicles. I hope you had fun with these algorithms. I'm happy to answer all your questions. All right, um, I'm at the end. Raul, I think I hand over to you for the, for the final slides, if that's okay. Yes, thank you, Anis. So, uh, so we will just presently uh, wrap up shortly here. And, you know, obviously uh, we, we love racing and we actually love it, you know, obviously it, it's very exciting, but we also like it because it's a great way to make all of these interesting ideas of machine learning engineering for perception, planning, control, so accessible, so available to everyone. And, and you know, our overall theme of why we do this is really uh, to get you, know, you involved and see how you can get involved. These are some of the past students. There are, there are dozens of more students who have gone through our courses and you know, they've benefited from that. And you know they've it's allowed them to pursue their interest in Tesla autonomous driving, Nvidia autonomy, Honda autonomous, Amazon robotics, and so on. And and the thing is, you know, how can you get involved? And um, so obviously, we you know we offer this course uh, for for free on f110th.org. And if you go to courses.f110th.org, you can see you can join any. It's an online uh, open edX course uh, that you can just join and take. Uh, there are many different projects that you can do with, you know, F110 after you learn the basics, uh, like Johannes had mentioned from, you know, the planning and the control aspects, but also, you know, much more on the perception side, which we did not dwell into as much today. Um, uh, and then there are, you know, obviously learning based approaches for every one of these, you know, 
white box analogs. So it's a very exciting area where you can both work in simulation and get your math into code, get your code into the car and see that happening right away. Oh. So one very interesting way and very fun way, and also I would say profitable way is that we is to get involved in the uh, autonomous racing competitions. And over the years, we've had several of these international Grand Prix at ES Week, at CPS Week, and in many of the robotics conferences, such as IROS. Uh, just a, a week ago, we finished the IROS 2021 competition. And where you can get involved just starting right now and is that the next big autonomous racing competition will be in May 2022 um, uh, in Philadelphia. That's where we are. And uh, you know, we'll be hosting the I ICRA International Conference on Robotics and Automation. And we'll have a huge track over here. It will be in person. It will be virtual also. So you can race in our virtual racing competition and then come to our uh, physical competition. It's easy to come by. And um, it's going to be a flagship uh, racing competition since we've done it many years. This one is going to be the biggest one we'll ever have done. And uh, we'll have all the code is available to get started and to get involved uh, on the f110th.org website. We, you can see how to build, how to code, how to race. Uh, all of that information is provided to you. If a faculty member in your university uh, is interested in competing, ask them to reach out to us or you reach out to us, just CC them and say, hey, can we borrow a car from you guys? And we can even lend you a car if your team is, if you have a team and you're willing to race uh, uh, for a few months for free. And then you can at least get started over there until you build your own cars. Uh, if you want to teach the F110 course, uh, also get in touch with us. It's just half an hour. The entire system is set up for you to get started with and you can customize it for your university. Uh, here are a couple of links, uh, you know, on uh, how to build the, uh, the material, how to actually get to the GitHub and uh, feel free to ask us any questions now. Um, and, and we are always available at contact at f 110sorg So it was really our pleasure to present to you all. I'll keep this slide up for a short bit more. And, uh, uh, and we are happy to take any questions in the remaining 10 minutes. Hey, Rahul, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can. Hey, and that's Andreas here. Thanks for the talk Hi. and thanks for giving the class. Uh, very inspiring. And um, we'll make this recording also available right, to attendees. That's okay with you guys, right? Uh, sure, for, sure. For the conference. Um, you posted a bunch of links and so on. They are all also on the slides, right, that were presented, right? Yeah. But I think the chat, Rick, the chat, it's all in the chat too, right? I think we can make that available too to add in these, right? So everything should be in there. Yeah. Well, thank you guys. Thank you very much. All yeah, right. Welcome. Any more questions from the audience? Again, thank you, Rahul. Thank you, Joannes. You're welcome. This was wonderful. I loved it. <laughs> Thanks, Avi.
Yeah, if there are no more questions, I guess you guys can hop off anytime, right? Yeah, yeah. We'll take a break till we get to the next uh, tutorial set. Thank you so much, everyone. Yeah, Bye. also, we have the Hangout Place in Garda Town, right? Um, yeah. You know, we can potentially mingle. I see so deep yeah. here. We can talk more about that, but yeah. But we have the other class starting in 10 minutes, I think. Andreas, one last question. How do I upload the material, the slides, to this um, course directly? Um, you should be able to have access to your speaker profile in Hoover. You can add material there. OK. OK. Um, that should give you access to the session, actually. Um, so upload it to the session, right? Mm -hmm. Let me know is if it, you have troubles in the email or so. Right. Is it is it just uh, my my profile, like my normal profile? So the Hoover profile should give you access to which sessions you're assigned to to speak mm -hmm. in, and then you can upload material to the session. Mm -hmm. Both both ways. I didn't see. Okay, then I will reach out to you on email again. Yeah, let's do it offline, right? Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.